So I want to welcome you all to this pod showcase. And uh, I guess this is also a celebration of what we hope is post-pandemic. Um, certainly this is uh, a, a significant milestone for us at uh, Midas because uh, we haven't had an event uh, and a nice gathering like this for, for some time. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, we've got a really packed agenda with a lot of cool stuff and we're at breakneck speed going to go through um, a bunch of different interesting things that many of you are doing and in different parts of this university. And, um, and so please do try to keep on time and uh, we'll, we'll uh, try to keep time too to help you uh, do that. So uh, the point of this is, is so that we can all um, get a bird's eye view of the fantastic uh, breadth and richness of work and hopefully make some new connections, uh, get some inspiration from things that some of our colleagues are doing. Um, I want to take just a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, what, what uh, Midas does. So uh, I've got our, our uh, mission statement up top there. Um, we try to promote uh, data science and AI in all its forms and uh, at all in, in, in many different ways. Um, and uh, we currently have about 450 affiliates uh, from across the university um, and about a thousand students uh, who uh, affiliate with us. Um, we are primarily focused on, on research, but we also do a bunch of stuff in terms of uh, skills training and uh, collaborations. Um, and um, there are a number of things that, that we do to uh, help, uh, and, and in particular, today we're talking about the PODS, uh, Propelling Original Data Science Awards. Um, we have, uh, in our lifetime, uh, the Midas awarded 52 projects, and these 52 projects uh, have led to uh, over 130 uh, external funded grants. Uh, that, that followed on uh, and brought in uh, over $100 million in funding to the university. So this is a very successful seed grant program and I hope that uh, that kind of success will, will uh, continue with the work that so many of you here are doing and that we are celebrating today. Um, we have uh, uh, training programs for researchers that I don't have a lot of time to uh, tell you about uh, but uh, we, we've done a, a boot camp for biomedical science and uh, a second one just recently we've, uh, we're in the middle of a boot camp for uh, environmental science um, and, and we've got this kind of a three-part formula. Um, in terms of our, our uh, energy and attention with the resources available, uh, last year, uh, we made a decision that we, would, we wouldn't try to be everything f uh, for everybody and would try to focus uh, our resources on a few pillar areas, still fairly broadly defined. And um, those are, these are the uh, four pillars that are our current pillars. And the intention is that we'll keep uh, changing these over time and, and try to cover all of uh, all of the needs on, uh, at our university. Um, one thing that I want to mention uh, is we have had a seminar series for maybe five years now that has been very successful in terms of bringing in uh, a really high level of talent to campus. And um, we are thinking of making a change to that beginning next fall. And uh, instead of having a weekly speaker where every week it's a surprise in terms of the breadth of data science and AI, what kind of topic might be covered, to try to do a more focused set of talks 
um, three, five, something like that, uh, in the form of what we're calling mini colloquia. And this may break the weekly cadence um, in that we may end up clustering these things, you know, whatever. But we, we are looking for ideas, and if you have mini colloquia that you would like to organize, maybe there's some cutting edge topic where you'd like to bring three to five people to campus, maybe even for a weekend workshop where you have a half day of talks that are public, and then you could have another half day of, you know, closed door meetings if you wanted, you know, things like this. Whatever makes sense for your area and, and uh, ideas. We're seeking ideas right now. Um, and we'll make some changes to the way our seminar series works. Okay. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, I should also mention next, in two weeks we have our uh, leadership, uh, future leaders summit, uh, and uh, with, with the focus on responsible uh, data science and AI. Um, and uh, that, that's gonna be our second post-pandemic event, we are at the first. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I'd like to just say, you know, we, we, want, we want to hear from you. We want to know your ideas, so please tell us. Okay, um, with that, I'd like to bring up, uh, da -da -da -da, I think, here we go. So I'd like to just jump into our talks and uh, request Albert to come up and speak. Thank you. So today I'll, I will want to talk about um, our proposal and a grant that we've uh, started working on with um, uh, a, a collaborator from the uh, um, industrial and uh, IOE department at the University of Michigan. So our proposal is called iPod. Of course that stands for, it's similar to iPod, effort pod, and it's innovative and, and powerful uh, optimization methods with, uh, for data science with statistical guarantees. And really we have two main uh, topics. One was to understand the global landscape of machine learning problems. And then through that, and with this information, to develop new uh, near parameter uh, algorithms. And so that's what I'm gonna focus uh, today. I'm gonna focus on the uh, part two of our uh, proposal. So when we look at these optimization problems or, or these machine learning problems, when I think about these as a uh, uh, nonlinear optimizer, well, I think about all these problems as, as the following. So we're trying to minimize some optimization problem um, where we have, in fact, where, where n and d, so the number of data points and the number of uh, 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 parameters that we have uh, is, is very large, and at the same time, our functions that we have are non-convex. And so, as a nonlinear optimizer, when I think about large-scale problems and non-convex problems, I think about, well, these problems are really hard to solve as optimization problems. And so the question that arises is, well, is training these, these problems, or is solving these optimization problems, is it easy? And if you go and, and ask and, and check uh, Stack Overflow, you'll see that people say, well, it's very easy to solve these problems, and the reason why it's easy, well, it's just use the stochastic gradient method or, or add them. From my experience, um, and our experience, what we have is, well, training these, these, these models is not easy at all. It's easy sometimes. Um, we need to be careful in the way that we set uh, 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 the parameters that we have. We need uh, starting, good starting points. We need good hyperparameters. Um, uh, hyper and, and, and all, always using um, some, some of the tricks. And so for me, solving these problems is actually very, very difficult. And what we've tried to do is come up with algorithms that work really well. So I just wanna give you an example of, of a problem where it's very difficult. So suppose that we wanna solve the following problem. We have a data set where we have 100 data points, and these are these uh, um, bled, blue and uh, red lines, and we have two classes. The class, one class is the class of the blue ones and the, and the red points. We have a, uh, a network, a neural network, that has six uh, layers and has 900 weights. And so we're trying to solve a very simple problem and we're, we have a pretty large network. And so the question is, how easy is it to solve this problem? Now the, the problem here is to de develop and come up with um, a good way to make predictions to 
that separates class one and class two. And so for Adam, for this Adam right here, it's very easy to solve this problem. So this Adam right here, this, 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 this guy, and all of you could probably build to be the best uh, uh, model for, for this problem. But unfortunately, when we look at um, uh, how it works in practice, we see that although it seems like it's very easy to get 100% and come up with a model that's very good, what we see is um, we see that accuracy is actually pretty low. And so a lot of the times what we see is that we're not able to get 100%, which is what we want to be able to do. What we get is um, worse uh, solutions. And so there's other uh, difficulties and issues with these algorithms, and I'm not going to talk about them in too much detail. What I wanted to do is talk about the fact that what we have been able to do is we have first order methods um, that work as, as Adam and, and the stochastic gradient method. We have second order methods, and what we have done, and this is the, uh, the Sonia algorithm, so this is a paper that was at, uh, accepted uh, uh, about six months ago, it's an algorithm where we're trying to take the best of both worlds. So um, we use first order information and second order information in, in, our, uh, in our algorithms. And so this is not some, just something that works well because we, um, w it works theoretically and so on and so forth. We see that there are huge advantages to use more sophisticated algorithms. The other thing that I should mention is that we haven't just worked on one, uh, one of these algorithms. We have a, t uh, a whole collection of algorithms. And one thing that I wanted to mention here is that um, three diff uh, two different undergraduate students at the University of Michigan plus a PhD student at the University uh, of the University of Michigan are, are, are have uh, helped through these projects. And in fact, the two undergraduate students um, are, have, have been funded through this, uh, uh, the PODS grant. Um, we've also um, tried to use the algorithms we've developed on, on real world problems and, and um, in collaboration with uh, people that are in mechanical engineering. And so we've used um, a, a the algorithms that we've developed in order to, to come up with predictive models um, to predict essentially um, to predict the NOx emissions uh, for different uh, um, heavy duty vehicles. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about is the fact that we started off with this PODS grant, which was again, innovative and powerful optimization methods for data science and s with statistical guarantees. And um, after we submitted this grant, we actually formed a team with uh, Laura Balzano, Salar Fatahi and uh, uh, Tassos Girilidis from uh, Rice University, and we sum submitted a grant to NSF um, uh, where our title is Robust Neural Networks from Landscape Analysis to Parameter-Free uh, Algorithm Design. Uh, and so with that, I'll, I'll end my talk today. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, so. The next speaker is Yunshin Bion from IOE, please. So everyone is our new kind of junior faculty member, so maybe he was so excited about being here. Uh, so I'm Yunshin Bion from Industrial and Operations Engineering Department. First of all, thank Jack and Midas committee uh, to organize this great event. So this project is about the coordination of multi-building uh, modeling and management for flexible grid service innovation. This is the joint work with my collaborator, Professor Raida Alcantara from our departments. Sorry, can I? Okay. So as you may know, like in the United States, residential and industrial commercial buildings make up three-fourths of energy consumption in the United States. Therefore, the uh, building control and automation becomes an essential part of smart building operations to meet building energy efficiency st standards as well as to uh, meet the um, occupant's comfort level and other service requirements. And thanks to advanced communication capabilities like IoT, Internet of Things, and smart metering and other smart communication technologies, increasing number of buildings provide grid services through demand response programs. And here the demand response program implies the adjusting the energy uses or power uses in buildings by shedding, shifting, modulating end uses to help support cost-effective and reliable power grid operations and uh, uh, operations and planning. 
And here I'd like to uh, uh, sub emphasize the demand response program. Traditionally, demand response program uh, was used to meet the anticipated shortfall, especially in the like hot summer days, then you have very peak like energy demand. So in those cases, we can kind of reduce the energy load, power consumption load in buildings. So that's the uh, typical demand response program does. However, uh, due to the increasing penetration of renewables, such as wind and solar, which is high, highly volatile, we cannot control power generation completely. We cannot really you know, uh, make a per perfect forecasting for these renewable energy sources. So because of this uh, volatility, it's, uh, it becomes quite challenging to meet the demand precisely. And therefore, the ancillary service to meet this uh, energy supply and demand becomes very important in power grid operations. And fortunately, buildings can be played as a role as the played a role as a grid assets that provides this ancillary services. So previously, de demand response was utilized at specific occasions, but building energy now can serve as grid assets at like a 24 hours, seven days. And here the goal is to, uh, the project goal is to create an integrated building energy demand prediction and control methodology to manage both traditional demand response and emerging ancillary services. And the team is uh, including team includes myself and my collaborator Raid Al Kuntar, and we have been collaborating with Christine Zetin from uh, Michigan State University, and also some uh, researchers and engineers at the uh, Dep Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So here is the overall framework. Uh, so basically, we want to manage multi-building uh, and coordinate the building energy uses to provide grid response services in this uh, modern power grid or uh, 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 microgrid that includes highly volatile renewable generations. So the overall tasks include three tasks. First, we want to develop some spatial temporal heterogeneous environment modeling, and second, scalable building energy use modeling. And then uh, these, the, the results of these two tasks will be used for decision making for demand response and ancillary services. So uh, for the heterogeneous local weather condition modeling, basically we use the outputs from WORF UCM model. WORF, WORF stands for Weather Research and Forecasting Model, which is the numerical weather forecasting model. But recently uh, we combined this WORF model with the urban canopy model to characterize some characteristics of urbanized areas. So this WORF UCM model provides very precise uh, forecasting, like a 24 hour of head temperature and humidity. However, our data shows some discrepancy between WORF UCM forecasting and actual weather conditions. So our first task is to correct this WORF UCM outputs to provide better forecasting. And then in our second task, we develop Bayesian transfer learning for scalable building energy use modeling. And here the thing is, uh, even though the demand response program has been used um, in the past, the ancillary service is pretty new. So we do have very scarce operational data that use ancillary, that like, uh, that operates building as the ancillary service. So to supplement this uh, data scarcity, we generate data from the uh, numerical building energy model. So in the numerical building energy model, we build some uh, building energy model for some representative reference buildings. And based on the data generated from this uh, building energy models, uh, we kind of integrate this data with the actual data to provide better uh, building energy models. Uh, I guess for the sake of time, I'm going to skip the details, but here for the uh, weather forecasting model here, the, um, uh, just uh, to show illustrate, the red is the actual, uh, the red is the WORF UCM projection, and blue is the actual temperature uh, at multiple locations, in this case in Texas area, and you see some like a systematic deviations, so we uh, developed some statistical models to correct this kind of deviations. And in the second uh, task, we, uh, we are building some scalable multi-building models using Bayesian transfer learning. Uh, and here, this is the timeline and associated products. Uh, for the first task, we uh, already built statistical models and implemented uh, our model using some data in Texas, Austin, and we, uh, uh, we published, I mean, we generated a couple of papers. Uh, uh, one paper has been already published and two papers are in the pipeline. And second task, which is the Bayesian transfer learning model is ongoing. And based on these data, we are writing proposals to be submitted to, uh, to, be submitted to some federal agencies and 
uh, hopefully by the end of this year, we are going to submit our proposal. Thank you very much. All right, yeah, well, good afternoon, everyone. Should I use this? Uh, yeah, I'm a fifth year PhD candidate in the Department of Chemical Engineering, and I'm here actually presenting on behalf of my advisors today who are both at a conference in San Diego enjoying a little bit better weather. Uh, but I'm gonna present on our work where we basically tried to use some interpretable machine learning approaches to kind of gain uh, chemistry insight, and I'll talk a little bit about the application. So work in our lab uh, focuses on the development of catalytic materials. And uh, you probably remember from kind of a general chemistry setting that uh, catalysts, these are materials that you add to a reaction to speed them up while not being consumed. And they're really important. We have the stat that we like to throw around that around 25% of global GDP comes from products either directly or indirectly produced using catalyst. This comes from things like uh, high volume industrial chemicals. So you can think like fuels and plastics, as well as uh, agricultural chemicals like the ammonia fertilizer that feeds around 2 billion people on Earth. Um, but work in our labs mostly focuses on some more emerging applications of catalysis. So uh, for things like renewable energy storage and generation, uh, hydrogen fuel production, as well as pollution mitigation applications like uh, wastewater remediation. So uh, in general, uh, when we talk about catalysts, the type of catalysts we're looking at are called heterogeneous catalysts, which means that these are solid state materials, usually metals or metal oxides that catalyze a liquid or gas phase reaction. An example would be these metal nanoparticles uh, synthesized by my advisor's group shown here. And in general, we want to design catalysts that meet these four criteria. So we want cat to have catalysts that are stable, meaning that they don't decompose under reaction conditions, active, meaning that they rapidly accelerate the desired reaction while also being selective, meaning that they don't accelerate any undesired side reactions that produce byproducts, and finally, low cost. Uh, many currently used catalysts consist of uh, scarce and rare earth metals like platinum and palladium, so we want to reduce those. But importantly, designing catalysts that meet these four criteria uh, really hinges on understanding any atomic scale interactions between the catalyst itself and the reaction environment. And understanding these atomic scale interactions can be extremely difficult or even impossible to probe experimentally. So consequently, uh, catalysis researchers have actually turned to quantum mechanical catalyst modeling as a means to uh, better understand and design catalysts uh, this has been a really fruitful area over the last 22, uh, 20 or so years, especially with the proliferation of uh, very high quality supercomputing resources. And in general, kind of the way this workflow works is that we uh, perform quantum mechanical modeling to map basically the structure and composition of the catalyst to uh, experimental performance by modeling uh, basically atomistic energies and forces, uh, you know, back out the properties that we want to study. But one downside of these modeling approaches is that, in fact, they do rely very heavily on high-performance supercomputing resources, such as this uh, Cori supercomputer at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which has primarily been used by our group. So the question for us then became, how can we maximize basically the insight and knowledge generation that we're getting from these studies uh, while minimizing the number of calculations required? Our approach was basically to turn to machine learning sort of as a surrogate model to replace or minimize these calculations. And I guess in particular, uh, one area that we were focused on is how can we build interpretable models that can actually uh, give us you know, some more insight into what are the properties of these catalytic materials that are making an impact uh, in, in their desirable properties. And uh, you know, this, I would say that this sort of has a, a synergistic uh, pr uh, feedback loop with what, how people are traditionally using machine learning in this area. So uh, kind of the, the simplest way to use machine learning for catalytic systems you would think is just to do high throughput screening. Um, and then you know, identify maybe some candidates that you want to study experimentally, uh, fingerprint and uh, record any structured property data that you can then use to further create machine learning models. Um, sort of on, in our uh, paradigm, what we're interested in is interpreting the machine learning models, identifying what are the important parameters that are making, uh, making our catalyst good. M maybe if we identify some physical parameters that are, are quite important, we can actually ad add additional features to the model or improve the model to better capture these salient features, and uh, they work sort of in tandem. The system that we've been studying uh, mostly so far has been these uh, subsurface layered alloys. The reason that we were focused on these is because my advisor uh, has synthesized some of these core shell alloy nanoparticles, so you can think that the subsurface alloy is a quite good approximation of these subsurface alloys. And the question we wanted to answer is how does changing the composition of these alloys uh, improve the reactivity? 
Uh, our, this, our, the pause grant has basically led to two publications in this area. Uh, one where we used these decision tree based generalized additive models to build geometric chemical property relationships and a second in which we used uh, sort of unsupervised approaches to uh, identify geometric electronic chemical property relationships. So I guess without diving into the minutia of these uh, too much, I just want to emphasize that we've basically, uh, even though we used two quite different approaches, we uh, basically arrived to convergent conclusions regarding the important physical parameters that affected the uh, chemical properties of these alloys. In particular, we found that applying a strain to the chemical system, changing the atomic size or changing the atomic valence electron structure uh, you know, change the reactivity of these systems, and this was uh, quite actually consistent with uh, physics-based approaches to try and understand the behavior of these systems, which uh, was a plus in our eyes. So uh, I guess in conclusion, uh, our work uh, sponsored by the POS grant uh, using interpretal ML provides a blueprint for designing various next-generation catalysts. Uh, we've so far focused on subsurface alloys and used two different approaches to study these, which gave us some nice physical insights. Uh, our future work is sort of focused on studying more advanced catalytic materials beyond these subsurface alloys, such as intermetallic alloys. Uh, actually, my ongoing work is focused on these metal oxide materials or even uh, metal carbides. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your time. Looking forward to the rest of the talks. Hi, thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Libby Hemphill. I'm in the School of Information with Kevin. Uh, I'm also in uh, ICPSR over at ISR. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about a new MIDAS pod project this year called Ensuring Fairness in Social Media Archives. Uh, so fairness, the underlying principle or a sort of problem that we want to solve is that social media data is really useful for research, uh, but that's not what it's designed for, and it's not how people who generate, oh, Mike, generate social media data think of themselves. They don't think they're research participants. Uh, and so how do we, as an archivist, I want to understand how do we make this data available for researchers without increasing the risks to people who are represented in the, people and communities represented in the data. Uh, and so fairness, this is coming in and out a little. Is it okay for you? Yeah, okay. Um, it means that data ought to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So these are principles in archiving data that when, it is, when data is fair, you can find it, you can access it, which is different from available. It means that with your skills, you can use it. Um, you can connect it with other data sources, and you can reuse it later. Uh, so that's what it means for data to be fair. So our project is trying to understand how do we make social media data fair? And our two overarching questions are to come up with collection development policies. So this is, archives are not just like attics where you just shove all your stuff. We make choices about what goes in them. Um, those choices are guided by collection development policies. We have to choose what will come in. Uh, the, on the flip side is the access policies. What will go out? Who will, what do you need to possess uh, in your team um, to make it useful for you to use the data. So for the first question is collection, development, and access policies. The second is indexing and access systems. So uh, does anybody know how much data you have on your laptop right now? Anybody got a number? 10 or 20 gigs, somebody's got something more than that. David? 100 gigs. 100 gigs, yeah. All of those are more data than ICPSR has had so far. Um, so we're the largest social science data archive in the world, and our data is smaller than yours. Uh, so for us to be thinking about working with large data breaks all of our systems. And one of, your defini one of the sort of popular definitions of what does it mean for data to be big is that it breaks your systems. Well, social media data definitely breaks the systems we have at ICPSR, specifically around indexing that what it means to index a survey, which is sort of the default type of data that we hold at ICPSR, um, we don't often index the observations in surveys, we index the survey as a whole. What is a social media data set? How do we know where it ends and where it begins? What counts as an observation that these types of questions break the indexing systems and the sort of technical infrastructure that underlie our ability to collect and provide access to data. So those are the two sort of big overarching questions that we need to solve. We cannot solve those questions in one year. We can't do it. So we're just going to make a little bit of progress. 
Um, the first is on collection and development and access policies. We don't really have a good understanding of how people who are represented in social media data think about their data in relation to other kinds of data. So we know that they don't actually think it's public. That when we post a public tweet, we're thinking public to the audience that I imagine, not all of us in here who they've never met and never heard of who might want to use it to do things like predict labor markets or to understand political discourse or whatever it is we're going to do. Um, so if they don't understand it as public, but they know that it's not private, how do they think about it? And how might it relate to other types of data that we already know how to take care of, like healthcare data, survey responses, sensor data, administrative records like the census, uh, that we can use what we already know about how to take care of sensitive data in archives to understand how to do this for social media data. Instead of thinking of it as like, oh my gosh, it's so brand new, there's nothing like this before, actually, there's a lot of really sensitive data about you out in the world being used by researchers uh, that's not just social media data. So we did a survey. Uh, we surveyed a little over 1,000 people from Qualtrics and MTurk, and we asked them, how sensitive is this data relative to other types of data? Uh, how do you think about it? Um, does it matter who uses it and for what purposes? And what we found is uh, that, so we compared it to uh, if, social, if academic researchers use posts from your social media data versus social media companies or journalists or people who study natural resources like biologists. Uh, and then we compared it to I guess I have a pointer. Which button is pointer? Aha. Uh -huh. OK, so a social media company using it for an intervention or a natural research trying to use it to understand the natural environment. So thinking about like uh, mapping the, what are those really good smelling flowers that are about to bloom at the ARB? Sorry? Peonies, yes, mapping peony gardens. This is like a thing that you can do with social media data. Um, and then the data types would be your cell phone location data, uh, s things you buy at the grocery store, security cameras, or your voter file. Uh, so these, in all of these, the reference category is social media data. So relative to your own social media data, how sensitive do you find this, and how okay are you with academic researchers using this data for these purposes? Um, and then the users are journalists and social media companies. What we find is that of all of these cases, People are more comfortable with you using, you, academic researchers, using their data from social media than any of these other data types or purposes. And these are things that we already do. Um, does anybody know what a voter file is? Is this a phrase that you're familiar with? So it's not just social media users who don't know that researchers are using sensitive data about them. If you're registered to vote in the US, your voter file is a collection of information about how often you vote and where, and all of the data that the voter file developer can buy about you from someone else to predict how you voted, when you voted. And that gets used in political science research all the time. Um, so it, when we're, th often researchers who use social media data are like, well, how could they not know that that's public? They're like, you would not even imagine what data I can buy about you today, which is equivalent to downloading it from an API uh, that you would feel a little uncomfortable with me having. So let's not judge the folks represented in social media data. Let's try to balance their needs with ours. And we're now getting started on the indexing and accessing systems. We're trying to figure out, uh, and we're doing this with support from MIDAS, additional support. We have a data set that MIDAS hosts for us, the US and Indian politician tweets. Um, and with ArcTS, we're trying to break arc, basically, and figure out what are the limits of the types of indexing and access systems that we can build, um, where we're taking data like all of Reddit from 2020, every tweet sent by a politician in the US or in India for 2020, and then some smaller COVID data sets um, to test different ways that we can sort of benchmark. If we do it in Elasticsearch, which is like the most expensive but f most user appealing way, um, all the way down to databases, and then we have sort of the Hadoop Parquet approach that we currently use for the Twitter decos here. We're comparing the computation and storage costs, the carbon dioxide and emissions costs of those, and then sort of what are the skills that teams need in order to use those data sets. Uh, you can find me on email or Twitter, uh, and I'm grateful to Ricky Punzelan at SI 
um, and our three graduate students for work in this space. Hello. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming and um, excited to share a little bit about what we're doing. Thank you to Midas for, for this funding and these opportunities. Um, I'm happy to be here on behalf of our research team. Uh, we're kind of a, a multi-purpose team from a few different places, but mostly from ICPSR here at ISR. Um, I'm David Bleckley, and the name of our project is Images to Integrated Data. Um, and we call it I2I for short. What we're basically doing is extending and documenting some methods for di digitizing semi-structured historical records and um, linking them to other administrative data. So while a lot of the problems that folks are talking about today are how do we deal with big data sets in real time, we're kind of like, how do we deal with old data sets today? Um, so the, the main focus uh, for this pilot is um, on what's normally known as the GI Bill, the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, which provided a whole host of different um, benefits to uh, folks coming back from World War II. Um, and one of those things is uh, guaranteed home loans for land or houses um, as the veterans came back from, from the war. Um, according to the Veterans Administration, about 2.4 million mortgages were guaranteed um, in the post-war years. Um, and those, those mortgages have been used by a lot of different researchers in a lot of different disciplines, from economics to political science, sociology, and they look at all different kinds of topics, um, ranging from the creation of the American suburban middle class, uh, the racial inequality inherent in that middle class, and uh, suburbanization, um, as well as just like the impacts to home ownership. Um, but none of these are based on microdata. Everything is based on these cumulative uh, reports or assumptions made or um, you know, taking something from the census and, and figuring like, well, these are probably GIs, these are probably World War II vets. Um, but nobody's used microdata from like an administrative records data set because as far as we know, none exists until now. Um, so, um, through some searching and talking with folks, um, we have identified a, a data set called the Index to Loans on Veterans Administration Guaranteed Mortgages, 1946 to 1954. It is a very cool title. I know. Contain yourselves. Um, it's, a, it's a collection of 23 linear feet of 3x5 index cards, also very exciting, 3x5 index cards, um, and it's housed at the National Archives in uh, College Park, Maryland. Um, so what that means is we've got 23 feet of paper that is hard to use, not, tabula not tabulated, not able to be analyzed unless you want to go sit in the basement of the National Archives in Maryland. So um, we want to digitize these and um, make them more accessible to people uh, to, to run the first analyses of microdata on the, the GI Bill mortgages. Um, so this is an example of what one of these cards looks like, except much smaller. You're seeing a really large version of a 3x5 card. But they're typewritten. They tend to be um, with a similar semi-structured format um, and have some really important data for us. Um, so how does this fit into you know, MIDAS and PODS? Um, we need to take these data and do a lot of different things with them in order to make them useful for other folks. We, need, we are digitizing them, so we don't want to have a piece of paper that we're sending around to thousands of different researchers for, for their input. We want to have a digital version. So we've scanned all of these to high resolution uh, image files. We're in the process of uh, doing optical uh, character recognition, OCR. On the output, we're, we're comparing several different uh, approaches to that so that we can see what's the optimal way to OCR these kind of historical records. Um, and then once we've got the OCR output, output we are um, parsing them um, using a few different methods. Um, we're using some named entity recognition as well as um, something that's really specific to this type of document analysis work, 
Um, it's uh, uh, called Layout Parser, and it's a deep learning um, document image analysis method. Um, so we're going to be doing all of these different um, tests and seeing what are the optimal ways of doing this and kind of like creating a, a prescriptive pipeline so that in the future, uh, you'd be really surprised at how, m how much of our historical records are um, contained on little things like three by five cards or semi-structured forms, typewritten documents that sit in, a, in boxes um, in a basement someplace. So um, by creating recommendations on how to best digitize those and tabulate them so that they're in an analyzable format, um, I think will be helpful for um, other folks who are doing historical analyses like this. Um, so here's a, a little bit of an example, um, some ideas for how folks can use these, um, these data. Um, you know, looking at the, the economic impacts of the GI Bill and its program on beneficiaries, um, specifically on racial disparities amongst those. We have a, a second um, pilot grant to kind of do some of those analyses um, to, to look at the, the racial Im implications of um, how these data, or how this uh, program was implemented. Also just looking at like the ge geographic distribution of the program, um, comparing that with maybe redlining maps, things like that. And then we also want to link these to other administrative um, records, looking at the World War II enlistment records, um, social security information, and um, census data. Um, but that'll, you know, increase the um, increase the impact of what kind of um, what kind of research you can do with these data sets. Um, so again, for this pilot, we're we're just looking at the the utility of machine learning to support this data parsing and record linkage. Um, we're recovering and disseminating a data set that's basically not been used ever um, by researchers, um, and increasing access to these collections, whether it be from academic researchers or journalists or uh, genealogists who are just interested in finding out, you know, how did grandpa or grandma get the house back in the 50s? Um, and that's, that's where we are. Um, thank you very much for your time. First of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, is this on or? Good afternoon, uh, everyone. And uh, first of all, thanks, Midas. Uh, okay, it was on. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thanks, Midas, for putting together uh, this uh, great pod showcase. It's really exciting to hear uh, all the great work that folks have been doing. So. Um, so I'm gonna present uh, our project, which is funded via this Midas Pause grant. And this is joint work with uh, uh, Professor Xiao Zhu Mei and uh, from uh, at School of Information and Professor Ming Shu from SEAS and two of our graduate students, Ya Chuan Liu and Bohan Zhang. So a common problem uh, that degrades the performance of many machine learning systems is, uh, can be seen here. So for example, for instance, consider a binary classification task where you're trying to predict whether something is a cat or a dog. And it turns out that you train your model on real images of those animals, but your test data maybe contains something totally different. In this case, they are the animated pictures of cats and dogs. So you can see it's already become a very hard uh, problem, uh, which could be hard for uh, machine learning classifiers uh, to, uh, to, to solve. And the reason for uh, this distribution shift is that the uh, that the distribution, that the joint distribution of the data and the labels, the P of X, Y, is different for the training and testing data. And this performance drop uh, at deployment time or test time could have like really bad uh, outcomes in many uh, different scenarios. So for example, it could lead to car crashes or misdiagnosis if it's a medical application, or it could lead to huge money loss if you are using a, a, like a deep learning model for making trades. So, so what we are interested in is we are particularly interested in a subset of distribution shift problems which are uh, called the group shifts. 
And there are two common scenarios in which these kind of group shifts happen. So scenario one is that the test data contains a new group altogether. So for example, think of this scenario where you train your model on different types of cameras, and now the test data contains a smartphone, which also serves as a camera, right? And the second case is uh, the case in which the group proportions of the test data are different. A good example of this could be, like think about a medical uh, like health records model, which is trained on patients in Ann Arbor, but it is going to be deployed uh, in Detroit. So as you can see, the demographic composition of um, patients in Ann Arbor versus Detroit is going to be quite different. And uh, so this is going to pose uh, like serious challenges for machine learning models and make them crash and burn. So a common approach uh, to solve this problem, uh, so, that, so just to remind like that the goal is that we want to do uh, equally across all the groups. Like if, the, if uh, like think about the, uh, uh, like the example about the patients in Ann Arbor and Detroit that I gave, we want our model accuracy to be the, to be same or similar across all the population groups. So a common approach for this problem is to just minimize the error of the worst performing group. It's also known as the minimax approach. It goes like this. You find the max uh, loss across all the groups and try to find the model parameters, theta, that would minimize uh, that loss, right? And there are many approaches based on this minimax framework, like group DRO and a bunch of its successors, about like 50 to 100 papers. So the key intuition uh, as to why this simple approach works is that, uh, that this approach assumes that the worst performing group on the training data would be similar to the worst performing group on test data. So if we could improve the performance on the worst group in the training data, we, we could generalize well to the worst group on the test data. Right? So our approach in like one slide is this. So, so our key idea is that instead of focusing only on the worst performing group at train time, consider uh, several poorly performing groups. So now you might say, why is this a good idea? It is a good idea because the worst group might not be similar, uh, might not be highly similar to the worst group in the test data, but if you consider a weighted combination of poorly performing groups, they are more likely to generalize well to the test data. And the point number one is even more salient for the case in which the test data would contain new group. For example, a new type of camera that is not even seen in the training data. So essentially, at a high level, what we propose is to do a kind of smoothing uh, or like a soft minimax approach where instead of just considering a hard one worst group, we consider a bunch of uh, like a weighted number of uh, uh, groups and look at their training errors and try to minimize that. So now, how do we bring our approach to life? So uh, we use some ideas from learning to, rank, learning to rank literature in machine learning and information retrieval, and it provides a natural way to assign these weights uh, to the different uh, training groups that I was mentioning about. So uh, just to give a, a brief primer on learning to rank, so uh, there are metrics such as normalized discounted cumulative gain, which, which assign logarithmically decreasing weights uh, to items ranked high to low to generate the overall relevance of the results for a given search query. So uh, here is our approach in general. So basically, you could use any uh, like off-the-shelf model, like any sh uh, uh, which is gradient-based, like let's say a multilayer perceptron or your favorite neural network, and then uh, between every epoch, we perform this simple upweighting of the worst performing groups based on the simple uh, logarithmically decreasing weights, right? And this upweighting can be performed to all the samples from a group or they can only be performed to the to, to only the misclassified examples from the previous epoch. Yeah, so it's as simple as that. So here are some experimental results. So, uh, so, there is, uh, so the task here is to, to, uh, to predict the sentiment, like one to five star rating, whether it's a one star, two star, till five star, on uh, Amazon reviews or Yelp or on IMDB. And the text is, the, uh, is like the review text uh, that the reviewers assign to them, uh, to the reviews. Uh, and a group over here is a user. So, uh, so users have lots of reviews on many of these websites. And uh, so user is a natural definition of a group here. And the test data would contain reviews from a totally different set of users that were not seen prior. So as you can see, our approach over here like, def like significantly improves uh, the worst group accuracy compared to like a baseline approach and a state-of-the-art approach. 
So next, as a second application, we wanted to look at a sustainability application. There's a giant NSF-funded urban innovation project uh, in Chicago, uh, Array of Things project. Basically, as you can see, there are a bunch of uh, sensors that are dispersed spatially over the city of Chicago, and they capture uh, emissions from uh, various gases such as hydrogen sulfide, CO, ozone, NO2, and SO2. So here is uh, how a sensor looks like. And in addition to, the, uh, to these emissions, it also contains information about temperature and pressure. So as you can see, like over here, uh, there's a big distribution shift, not only spatially, that is sensor which is in downtown Chicago might have different reading than the one that's in suburbs of Chicago, but there's also temporal effects. So for example, even a sensor that's in downtown Chicago in summer might have significantly different pattern of readings than it would have in winter uh, in downtown Chicago. So we use our model uh, to do the upweighting, and the LSTM is the base learner. That is, at each epoch, we train an LSTM model to predict the emissions at day t using data till uh, f uh, fr from days 1 till t minus 1. So as you can see, even over here, uh, like both the average and the, uh, and the worst group errors in our case uh, is lower. So in this case, a group is a, is, a, is a node or a sensor which collects the data. So in terms of the timeline of this project, so we started it in July 2021. We, uh, we proposed this model, validated it. We've submitted a conference paper to KDD based on this model, and we processed and organized uh, the Chicago sensor data. So in progress, so we're currently writing a grant where uh, you can naturally see extensions of our discounted ranked upweighting approach to fairness scenarios where the groups are, could be the demographics of people. And guess what, in many cases, in many times, uh, those groups might not even be salient. You might have to infer uh, some of the latent intersectional characteristics of demographics of people just from the data. So, and then we are uh, working on a paper submission on the sustainability application and a bigger uh, multi-PI uh, NSF grant for robust ML for sustainability uh, towards the end of this year. Thank you. Hey folks. Oh, you need the. Uh, Jing is going to advance my slides for me because I don't have enough hands. I'm Bill Curry. I'm a professor in the School for Environment and Sustainability, or SEAS. And actually, I think the next three talks are from SEAS, and the last one had a professor from SEAS as a collaborator. So um, I don't think we've ever had this big a footprint in MIDA Symposium before. So it's really. Great to be a part of it. Um, so this is really Runzi Wang's research. She couldn't be here today, but um, she's a new assistant professor. It's her research program. Um, so I'm in the dangerous position of speaking to someone else's slides, and that's why I have to uh, read from my notes. Um, I just want to start by thanking Midas for this funding because um, it's been really great to, uh, um, for Runzi in particular, she was able to um, develop some new ideas and to in include uh, five students at different points um, to work on this project. So, uh, next slide, Jane. So, uh, urban development impairs water quality, but our understanding of it is only in the broadest brush strokes. Uh, Runzi wants to use data science approaches to combine existing data sets in new ways to do statistical modeling. And some of the questions that she's addressing are. Do the spatial pattern of impervious surfaces and green space matter? Um, we know that they matter, but does the spatial pattern matter? Does the density of development matter? Do social metrics like population demographics, household wealth, and so on correlate with either the spatial patterns of development and or um, patterns of water quality? And do large-scale climatic drivers mediate these relationships? For example, you have different relationships between urban form and water quality in different climatic zones. So the MIDAS project goals were to construct a database to address some of these questions at the continental scale um, and develop some interpretable algorithms to study these relationships. Next slide. What we've done this year is a pilot study, really just methods development, taking the methods all the way through in a somewhat simplified way to see where the problems and where the successes are. Uh, so we have some results I can show you today, but just very preliminary. 
So working across the entire continental United States, we did an overlay of urban areas with Huck 12 watersheds, which is just, um, Huck 12 watershed is a certain designation that's um, a USGS designation. It's a, think of it as about, on average, 40 square miles. It's a unit of land with a stream or river in it that drains the precipitation from that land, and on average about, about 40 square miles in size. So we overlaid those with urban areas, and we looked for upstream and downstream points where water quality was measured and reported by US Geological Survey. Um, the original plan was to calculate nutrient loads. You, you multiply the stream discharge by the concentration of pollutants, um, and you take a upstream, downstream point and subtract the two, so you get sort of the difference between the two and the effect that the urban areas have on mediating, mediating that difference. Unfortunately, um, we discovered pretty quickly it wasn't possible to do the ups, upstream minus downstream subtraction because the way these sampling points are distributed, if you have two in the same urban area, they tend to be on different forks of a river or a stream, so you can't do an upstream minus downstream. Um, so we ended up taking the lowest point in elevation um, in these Huck 12 watersheds as sort of an outflow from the urban area. Next slide. Yeah, so just showing you the climatic region that uh, Runzi used to separate the United States into these uh, 12, I think, climatic regions. Next slide. Uh, this is the USGS database on stream water quality. You can see how the measurements uh, tend to be sort of clustered. Um, stream water quality variables we're looking at in this study uh, so far are nitrate, total phosphorus, and total suspended solids, or TSS. Um, you can see her workflow on the right, um, where you do the overlay of the Hub 12 watersheds in the urban areas, and you look for these stations that occur within that watershed. Um, so you're sort of merging three continental scale data sets. Based on this workflow, we came up with 500 points, which the preliminary results I'm going to show you today are those 500 points, but we think that's, that's really not enough. We want to try to uh, work at a, at a finer scale, and we think we can get that up to about 3,000 points, but um, then you're looking at processes at a finer scale. Next slide. So water quality is the dependent variable. We had 39 independent variables um, in various categories shown here. What's new is the landscape configuration. So the spatial pattern of impervious surfaces and, and green areas. Um, and unfortunately, we weren't able to get those metrics ready for this analysis. We're still working on those. Um, but when we do, that'll be one of the new parts. And another new part is including things like population demographics in the same model as all these other independent variables. Next slide. Uh, so Runzi uses a um, linear mixed effects model where each water quality variable is a dependent variable in a set of models. Um, she takes those 39 independent variables and she uses a knockoff algorithm to remove the independent variables that don't offer enough explanatory power. And I'm really glad there's not a question and answer session after this, so I don't have to answer how that works. It's, uh, like I said, it's really her research. Um, then of the ones that remain, and in this case, the pilot study, you, you have about 10 or 11 that remain out of the 39. Uh, they enter into a Bayesian hierarchical model. And the strength of that is the Huck 12 watersheds and like climatic regions are nested at two different scales. Next slide. So just to really quickly show you some preliminary results, these are the preliminary results from both the knockoff and the Bayesian modeling. Um, and again, really this is just methods development and proof of concept. So TSS, total suspended solids, um, increases where you have more cropland, you have more rental properties, more human population and higher temperature, and total suspended solids decreases or water quality gets better. The more forest that's present, the higher the median household income, um, and the more medium intensity development. That last one, where there's more medium intensity development, the water quality gets better, um, that really takes some time to interpret and, and it's, it shows how the care has to be taken in interpreting these. So the idea is for the same population. 
For the same human population in a watershed, the more medium density, density development, the better the water quality. That's because the alternative would be more low density development on average. So if you have more low density development, there's more impervious area. So um, it takes a little while. Some of these results can be non-intuitive, and it takes a little while to think through and really understand, getting deep into the data to really understand what's happening. Next slide, just to show you again, proof of concept. Um, the Bayesian hierarchical modeling was able to find different relationships in different climatic regions. Next slide, and I'm gonna finish here. So that uh, result I talked about, when you control the population, the more compact the development is, seems to lower the total suspended solids, um, which is kind of getting at one of her main research questions, the, the relationship between urban form and water quality. Second bullet point, the socioeconomic contexts um, can produce some interesting results here. The number of rental houses and median household income, race and ethnicity have strong associations with stream water quality. So this brings up a really interesting environmental justice issue that could be um, sort of investigated with this, with this data set. Um, and then finally, uh, and the next step, so now we've done this proof of concept, we're gonna go back through and run through the whole thing again in a more sophisticated way. Um, we're going to try to add another level in the spatial hierarchy. So instead of just HUC-12 watersheds and the climatic regions, we're going to add um, cities or counties as another, uh, as another layer in the hierarchy. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Ayemi Fujisaki Manome uh, at Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research, which is hosted within SEAS. Um, so our research project is more really applied end of data science research spectrum, and the title is Supporting Decision Making for a Vital Waterway in the Great Lakes by Machine Learning Model-Based Ice Forecasting. So uh, it's really a team effort. Professor Christiana Jabodorowski from CRASP, she brought a uh, really strong expertise on machine learning modeling technique. And we are lucky enough to have two very smart students from SEAS, Lian Liu and Shanti Dave Du, and I also Hago Afu from SIGRA, and Dr. Philip Chu from NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. They are also part of the team. Uh, so our project focused on North American Great Lakes, which provides uh, waterways and that really support maritime transportation both in the United States and Canada. And not only just for Great Lakes, it really supporting nation's economy both in the United States and Canada. And uh, as you can see in this satellite picture, in winter time it develops ice cover. And that's a big obstacle in navigation and really poses a challenge in navigational safety and planning. Um, so, for example, in St. Mary's River, which is a connecting waterway between Lake Superior and Lake Huron, um, you know, you can see cargoes navigating in icy condition, you know, in Lake, sorry, in St. Mary's River system. So, Normally, when they navigate in icy conditions, they require assistance by U.S. and Canadian Coast Guard, which breaks ice so that they can navigate in you know, ice-covered waters. Um, it's really important for shipping community to know ice condition ahead of time, you know, such as where ice moves, where ice forms, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow, over the next couple of days. So uh, you know, if they don't have that information, and then know, start their navigation in bad timing, it's very possible that the crews on the ship get stuck in icy condition for more than 48 hours. Of course, that's not healthy. And then that also results in a stoppage of supply chain. You know, your iron ore, limestone, and daily supply, the supply chain will stop. So that's a huge negative consequences. So uh, in this background, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is in the process of upgrading their operational forecast system for Great Lakes uh, to provide ice forecast for Great Lakes. 
So it's based on process-based numerical model, you know, based on ice and hydrodynamic model. Um, the figure at the bottom shows an example of what this process-based model can provide. It's a simulated ice cover in Western Lake Erie. The red region indicate a high ice coverage and blue region indicate low ice coverage. And there are many, many triangles, which is computational mesh. There is no ice in there. Um, so these are very helpful, but uh, at the same time, it's very expensive in terms of computational cost. And also, the river systems are very small compared with lake-wide spatial scale and very complex geographical uh, feature. So it's kind of challenging to resolve um, its physics you know, by process-based model. So as a result, uh, NOAA's operational forecast system, they don't include river system in, in their end product. So that's uh, what motivated us in developing this pilot machine learning model for ice forecast over the river system. So what we designed uh, for this pilot is we developed two machine learning models. Uh, what we did is we prepared input data consisting of atmospheric data, such as air temperature, climate indices, such as ENSO, which stands for uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation, water surface temperature data, satellite-based ice data, uh, and then feed them into two different machine learning models based on XGBoost and LSTM and get the time series of forecasted ice cover condition over the St. Mary's River system. So this is just one example snapshot. Uh, you're, what you're looking at is a time series of ice cover over the river system over two winters from 2018 to 2020. Um, blue is from observation and orange and green are from the two machine learning models. Red is from baseline. Baseline is essentially a mean of many, many years. So it's kind of normal year condition. So I don't have any scale scores here, but uh, what we found is both two models have a predictive power compared with baseline forecast. So that's good. Um, this is another way to show the model output. It's a uh, duration of ice season over the river system. So x-axis is, is months and, sorry, y-axis is months and x-axis are essentially each winter from 1995 to 2020. Um, so you can see that the two models can capture interannual variability of ice duration. So that's nice. So I'd like to highlight that this uh, work was really informed by stakeholder engagement processes. Uh, we have done extensive stakeholder engagement activities for NOAA's operational forecast um, model product. We worked with shipping industry, US and Canadian Coast Guard, and NOAA's operational forecasters. And what we found is that um, the river system, you know, ice condition over the river system is really critical for the decision making, but it's kind of a gap. So that's really informed, um, you know, this project. And it, we've been in communication with National Weather Service officers and they are very excited about this pilot product. Um, so the result I showed today is just a few snapshots, but uh, Leanne and Shanti and the whole team did a whole bunch of work, including hyperparameter tuning and so on. Uh, we also presented the result at Estuarine and Coastal Modeling Conference last year. And really our next step is to submit uh, our manuscript. So we already drafted a manuscript based on the finding. So uh, hoping to submit th this manuscript in a month or so. That's all, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to see everyone here. I've been allocated 17 minutes, but I think 
we're running a little bit behind, so I might be able to compress it, and hopefully we'll catch up a little bit. So my name's Josh Newell. I'm an associate professor here at SEAS, the third SEAS presentation. And this is a project with Marie O'Neill in the School of Public Health and Karina Gronland in ISR. And especially, I want to give a big hand to Demetrius Gunaridis, who's really doing a lot of the heavy lifting for this. So if you have any technical questions after my presentation, please uh, ask, ask Demetrius. Um, at any rate, what we're trying to do is using a, use a, a variety of geospatial data, and we're overlaying this data to uh, try to identify communities that are particularly vulnerable to climate change. And this is just to step back a little bit. One of the challenges in sustainability is to figure out what to prioritize, right? So we could prioritize star stormwater, or we could prioritize uh, environmental health, or a combination thereof. And so what we what we do, some of the challenging things we do in the world of sustainability is kind of what are the trade-offs between environmental sustainability, social sustainability, economic growth? What is the you know what do we want to conserve? What do we want to develop? And how can we try to reach an optimal zone, right, between equity, the economy, the environment, right? And those are, those are difficult questions that have trade-offs, and are, it's a political process, too, when it comes, comes down to it often. And are, is one sphere more important than the other? Should we prioritize the environment more than the economy because our economy is based on you know, natural resources that drive our economy, as an example? So, so that's some of the challenges. And one of the ways that we deal with this in my lab and amongst C's faculty generally, is to think about large-scale spatial data sets and overlay them, because data sets are representative of some of these priorities of, of sustainability, whether those be economic or environmental or socially, social vulnerable data, right? So we basically select these, these variables, we overlay them, and then we use a, a series of weighting techniques. Um, these can be sort of um, optimization weighting, but we can also use stakeholders to weight and prioritize, right? So that's that's really where we're headed in this project, is to use stakeholder feedback to actually guide and redraw the maps and identify hot spots of vulnerability based on these, these stakeholder priorities. And I really find this interesting in terms of these interactions. So I'm a geographer, but I, we can layer whatever we want on top of things and look at really un, uh, unforeseen relationships that emerge out of it, right? And what I think it does is it reflects the richness and inclusive that's, inclusiveness that's ne necessary if we're going to have sustainability that, that really is robust, okay? So um, one example of what we've done uh, with this is to uh, evaluate where green infrastructure should be cited. This is a, a case study in Detroit, right? So we're, we're trying to layer different priorities for green infrastructure. So green infrastructure can be cited to abate stormwater. It also provides green space, right, for park poor communities, right? So we can layer that priority. We can think about it to ameliorate urban heat island, right? So we can think about that. And so what we did in this project is, is we overlaid all of these different priorities, stakeholders weighted these, and then we identified the trade-offs between these priorities and the hot spots. So that's just a, a precursor to sort of where we're headed with this climate change work. We've also done this with building emissions and income. I won't talk about that here in the interest of time. Um, but in this project specifically, we're, we're lay overlaying flooding vulnerability, heat vulnerability, and knowledge vulnerability, which is really what the Midas uh, pr uh, support has enabled us to do, is really uh, look at, use Twitter data, massive amounts of Twitter data, to identify climate change denialism in the United States. And I'll show you some maps related to that. And thanks to SEAS, we actually have funding to continue this work and really work more deeply on the heat vulnerability, which, as I'm learning from my public health colleagues is very, very, very complicated, right? So this is, uh, we're using 7.4 million geotag tweets. Uh, and Demetrius, if I miss something, please please fill in as I, as I go through here. But basically with climate change keywords from 1.3 million unique users, and we basically cl classify these tweets as either deniers and believers based on a deep learning natural language processing algorithm. Got that one. And these are some initial results. We did it by state, and we did it by county. And you can see how denialism, uh, the skeptics, as percentages going up higher here. Oh, sorry. The dark red are higher skepticism. You can see how it clusters. And it really closely aligns, unfortunately, with certain types of um, sort of conditions or positions. And the largest, uh, the highest correlation is with political affiliation. Of, of all the, the um, analysis we did, COVID vaccination rates were also very high. So people resistant to COVID 
indicates, I think, a general skepticism of science, perhaps, and also translates into skepticism of climate change. We have other things here, like the carbon intensity of the economy, the degree of urbanization, race, and ethnicity. Um, but, but we're really surprised and struck by sort of the really high correlations, even at the county level here, uh, with respect to political affiliation and COVID vaccination rates. This is a spatial hot spot map of denialism and uh, its correlation with Republicans. And you can see how it clusters in various parts of the country. So the high red is high skeptics, high Republicans. Um, and then we have high believers, high Democrats, low believers, low, high Democrats. You can see how this aligns. This is using a, an approach called LISA, right, uh, Demetrius? What does that stand for? Okay. A spatial clustering technique that's used in, in a lot of spatial analysis. And then we, add, uh, we uh, sort of analyzed this, the social media anatomy, and we actually mapped, influ using social network analysis, we mapped influential denialists, which are the right ones, and we've labeled their, their Twitter handles here, and the believers. And you can see that the believers are a much larger um, segment of, of the, tw the Twitter sphere than than the skeptics. But nonetheless, we have some very influential skeptics here, including especially Donald Trump and some other right-wing media. So we've analyzed this, and we've classified this, and we've actually done uh, additional analysis to see when these tweets spike over time. And you can see the, the various events that trigger these, the, these tweets. And, you can, and you, we've then classified these tweets based on what kind of denialism it falls under. Under. So impacts are serious or not serious. Humans are the main cause of climate change or they're not. Climate change is real. Climate change is not real. So we've classified all these tweets of these event-driven sort of events into these, these categories. And so we can see what types of, how denialism sort of manifests itself. Yes. And this is important when we think about what to do in, in the future and how we might combat uh, climate change skepticism, right? So. We're, we've done that, and now we're engaging on um, flooding vulnerability using building condition and index modeling, basically. So flooding vulnerability, we have a very detailed data set from, what is the source, a flood factor? Uh, very detailed, it has 145 million buildings in the US, and, we're, and Demetrius is building a model to basically um, incorporate the condition of the building into the, and make this part of the calculus in terms of flood vulnerability, right? So then we get an integrated measure of vulnerability for flooding. Um, I won't go into the details here, but you can certainly follow up, especially with Demetrius, related to how he's planning to do this. And then finally, we're uh, working with public health, Karina Grunland in particular, to develop a, an approach to identify heat vulnerability in the state of Michigan. That's the trial first. Um, and she's using a variety of um, data sets, and especially visits to emergency rooms and so on and so forth to basically build a similar spatial layer of heat vulnerability, okay? And then we're going to combine those three and present this initially. The plan is to present this to stakeholders in Detroit and in the state of Michigan and have them give us feedback on the layering, the weighting, and just some guidance on some of the accuracy of our, of our modeling as well. So that's the plan, um, and we have a lot more to do, but we're really excited about this project, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Josh. You know, we scheduled a couple of breaks, but um, I don't know, I feel really energized by these zip talks, and we're way behind time. So um, I, I, I'm thinking we should probably skip the second break, too, and just keep going. Uh, but before we continue, I want to recognize uh, Sean Mayer, who is the primary organizer of today's event. He's standing there in the back. Um, um, with uh, uh, a lot of help from uh, James Walsh, who's in the back, and of course, our managing director, Jing Liu, who, who runs the ship. And she, she's sitting there. Um, so uh, our, our uh, next uh, speaker is, uh, I'm blanking out, is David Jurgens.
All right. Is there a clicker somewhere still? Oh, here it is. All right, perfect. All right. Uh, let's see if we can get this scheduled break. No longer. All right, so uh, I'm David Jurgens. I'm over in the School of Information. This is a joint collaboration with Allison Earle, who's in the Department of Psychology. Uh, and we're looking at racial disparities in healthcare. Uh, so I, I think to get in the, in the moment, I want to ask everyone to sort of picture themselves in their doctor's office. Uh, all, everything I'm going to show here is like stock footage and sort of made up quotes. But you can sort of just put yourself in this, this idea. And the doctor says something like, oh, did you understand any of that? And you're like, okay. Or they're like, you know, I'm guessing you ha probably haven't heard of this medicine. Or let me try to simplify what's going on here. And, and maybe like taken together, these sort of things, like, oh, they maybe seem somewhat innocuous. Uh, but they really kind of minimize the role of the patient, and they can come off as somewhat uh, as a, a downward uh, d discussion trend. And so uh, we, we notice that this is actually a very common thing in particular, that physicians have been well known to be documented as having these kinds of behaviors. So in particular, uh, physicians uh, in racially discordant interactions, so as a, a white physician with a black patient, uh, are, are more selective in the kind of things that they say. They, they have a, it's a less positive, less effective medical interaction. And we know this. We don't know what they're doing, but we know that that has a less effective outcome. We know, in fact, that they have, uh, when you walk into a room, physicians have implicit biases. They form judgments about who you are and what sort of maybe problems you have or access to other sort of medical technology that you might be able to, uh, or medical um, affordances you might have access to. Uh, and we know that they have verbal and nonverbal indicators. In the fact that we don't actually still don't know much about what these are, but uh, patients report as experiencing them. So Allison Earl and I were like, hey, you know, we, we know all of these things. It'd be really cool if we could actually study this uh, at the language level to see what is going on in the, in the physician-patient interaction specifically. And so we, we thought, you know, really it's the language of physicians that matters that we're going to try to study here. So our goal is really to think about this physician-patient interaction. So we're going to try to look at these kinds of comments that physicians specifically say. So how are you today? We'll run some tests on that. We're going to take all of those things and sort of push them through NLP. I like using NLP stock footage because it's always blue and has some sort of very neurally looking thing to it. Uh, but we're going to run it through some NLP system to do text processing and then get some sort of behavioral report back out. Sort of the, that's the general flow of what we're going to be looking at. So to actually accomplish this, we actually had access to this incredibly unique data set provided by some of our colleagues at Wayne State University. So we're going to start off with uh, actual patients who are on their first visit. And this is, in this case, we have access to 62 interactions between real physicians and real patients going in for some prostate cancer-related screening. It's uh, a pretty good blend of uh, black and white patients. Uh, we have some racially concordant and discordant interactions in there. This is incredible data that we have full text, full audio, so we can actually measure like versatic cues or like, oh, you know, you can actually kind of capture that kind of thing. Uh, we also have video interactions. <laughs> we'll see if we get to video just yet. Uh, but it's an incredibly rich data set that's been collected. Uh, and we also have partial view into patients' medical history. So we have not the full medical records, but we have demographic characteristics and some uh, other selected categorical variables on there. So a pretty amazingly rich data set that we can start to work with. This is the first of a few that they have, but the hope is that this Midas grant uh, will lead to many deeper studies on this kind of data. So for the most part, they are not, uh, the folks at Wayne State are, are not doing any NLP on this. They're like, yeah, we could look at this text. We're like, yes, please give us this data. So uh, how are we going to model a physician's behavior? So you can imagine, uh, we'll just take something like this. What kind of insurance do you have? Uh, and the standard thing is maybe to dump it into the UMIS psych pool and have them to, to rate it. And this, in particular, we're going to look for three different aspects. We're going to look at respectfulness. We're going to look at empathy and politeness. These are all kind of related constructs, and we're going to try to do a joint rating to see what, you know, there are different loadings using some sort of PCA approach. Uh, of course, if you think about what kind of insurance you have as a sort of decontextualized thing, it seems innocuous, but maybe that's a response to something like, what does my prognosis look like? Can you actually like, what kind of insurance do you have? So uh, you actually probably do need to see the context in this case. So we're going to try to test how context sensitive are these interactions uh, to take a look at this. We're also going to be exploring not just using the psych pool, but using uh, different kinds of uh, community level aggregates. Uh, so going to like the Secretary of State's office, everyone has to go there at some point, and you might as well like do something while you're sitting around and rate uh, physician patient interactions. Uh, so to do this computationally, again, we'll, we'll use some sort of stock photo NLP li library. We're going to take all of these psych pool annotations, use them to train some model. 
And then we'll take all the conversations that come out and get some sort of chart that comes out to look at, are there racially discordant or concordant behavioral differences in how doctors treat patients, controlling for all sorts of things in the interaction. So overall, our research plan looks something like this. We're going to like annotate this great, great data set for looking at these transcripts of, for, and annotate them for respect and empathy and politeness to really understand the language of physicians. We'll develop some classifiers to recognize these in text using community uh, informed guidelines, and then we'll actually try to an apply this to the full tra text transcript. So this is uh, our plan that said, uh, you notice there's no results yet, because we're actually stuck right here. It turns out for very sensitive data, there's always an increasingly exponentially complex like process to get this data physically here. Uh, and then due to COVID pandemics and uh, uh, retirement, uh, key retirement, we're sort of stuck at the moment, but we're very close, literally sending out uh, contracts today. So we're sort of in, in the blank. So hopefully, you know, in the middle of this, you've seen here, and the next time you see me will be at the very end, and you can kind of forget that, that middle part, or there'll be more concrete details. Uh, but again, I want to thank uh, Jack and Ching for like, uh, facilitating this, because it was, this would not be possible, and it's nice to see this kind of, uh, hopefully a longer-term collaboration between Michigan and Wayne State happening around this kind of physician-patient language. So thank you so much. Mic good? Just take this off. All right, great. Um, thanks for having me. Great to be here. It's been really fascinating to hear about everybody's work. My name is Patrick Kinnanen. I am presenting on the behalf of PIs listed down there. Uh, Kathy and Gary Luker, both in the radiology department, Nicola Banovich in CSE, and my PI, Jennifer Linderman, in chemical engineering. And we're talking about how we are going to discover causes of cancer recurrence using inverse reinforcement learning. So we just learned about patient doctor interactions, we're way down at the other end of the scale, like trying to understand the molecular basis for why cancer occurs and what might be causing that you know, uh, doctor-patient interaction. So first, I want to talk about the importance of cell cellular heterogeneity. Um, on the left, we have maybe sort of a traditional view of a tumor. Um, it's a bunch of cancer cells, which we're trying to kill, and some other stromal cells, which are around the tumor. Um, what we're starting to realize, and we've been realizing this for a while, is that all of those cancer cells are very different. Uh, they can have different genetic mutations, but they can also have non-genetic uh, differences that cause them to behave differently. And that behavior, those behavior differences are very important when we think about something like metastasis, which is actually a key driver of cancer death. Um, in metastasis, the whole tumor isn't picking up and moving somewhere else. Just a few cells are migrating to somewhere else in the body. And so we need to understand not the, the bulk tumor behavior. We need to understand the behavior of individual cells to try to understand why some of them are migrating, and hopefully prevent them from migrating. So in order to study this single cell behavior, um, we do video microscopy. So on this slide, and we're using this to track cell behaviors. The behaviors I'm focusing on here are motion and division. So cells are constantly moving around and dividing. Um, and in cancer especially, one of the hallmarks of cancer is uh, sort of exponential cell division. So this is tracking uh, the same field of cells over time from t equals zero to 60 minutes. And what you see is uh, a nuclear marker showing the DNA of cells. So at time zero, that cell uh, circle just looks normal. And then at 20 minutes, all of the DNA condenses, the cell prepares to divide, and by 60 minutes, it's now split into two cells. Um, but notice, you know, those other cells aren't dividing, they're just kind of doing their own thing. These aren't all the behaviors we can track as well. So we can also look at cell signaling. Uh, cell signaling is a way cells perceive their environment. They respond to stimuli in order to sort of best um, you know, maintain homeostasis. And so we can also, using other fluorescent reporters, we can see how cells are behaving uh, in different signaling pathways. And these signaling pathways are oftentimes associated with cancer. So um, you know, we're using this fluorescent reporter. Um, if cells are sort of off, um, all of the signals in the nucleus, and if they're on, you'll see these kind of donuts. So you can see at uh, initially, everybody's off. We give this strong growth factor stimulus, and all of the cells turn on. And then if we look two hours later at the same cells, you know, this cell is still strongly on, this cell has turned off pretty strongly, and then these other cells are kind of in the, in the middle. So the point here is there's a ton of heterogeneity in this small population of cells. Uh, what I'm here to tell you is that we don't have a small population of cells, uh, we actually have like millions of cells. 
So we do this video microscopy at pretty high throughput. So that, that field of five cells that I showed you, that's part of a bigger field. And we're running these experiments in 96 well plates. So we can have you know 96 different conditions potentially. So we need some way of understanding this data. And the other thing that we need to make sure that we're doing is respecting the physical constraints that the cells are under. So some other work that I wanna talk about is that these behaviors are mediated by physical rules. Um, cells don't have electrical, like they don't have cell phones to understand their environment. All of their communication and all of their sensing is mediated by chemical reactions. So there are physical constraints underlying those chemical reactions and we have to make sure that when we're understanding this data and trying to come up with understanding for why cells are doing what they're doing, um, we're not just coming up with these crazy arbitrary rules. So this is a model that connects EGF, that growth factor I talked about previously, with uh, the signal that we saw on the previous slide. And there's a whole bunch of other proteins mediating those interactions. So uh, this kind of leads to our question that we're trying to answer using inverse reinforcement learning, which is, you know, why do different cells have um, different amounts of these proteins and what, you know, what are sort of the consequences of that? Um, in order to learn sort of cellular motivations or like why cells might be doing different things, um, we're using a technique called inverse reinforcement learning. And what that allows us to do, so forward reinforcement learning um, is used to learn a policy that will allow an agent to optimize some behavior. Um, inverse reinforcement learning is sort of the opposite case where you have a large set of behaviors and you're trying to understand what rewards or goals the agents are pursuing. So we're sort of assuming that our cells have some underlying reward or goal and that's leading them to have heterogeneous behaviors. Um, so in order to do this, we have to discretize cells into states and actions. This is kind of messy and this is very much a first pass, but some states might be static or moving or mitotic or non-mitotic, that means dividing or not dividing. Um, and they can also be um, environmental sort of uh, states. So it could be, is the cell in a dense environment or a sparse environment? Um, we also have some actions. So the cells might start dividing. They might migrate along a chemical gradient or a density gradient, um, or they might migrate in the other direction. Um, and so what we can do is we can take that huge set of uh, cell behaviors that we have, and we can discretize it into these states and actions, and we can actually infer what the cell's motivations are. So when we do that, um, we get these somewhat low resolution graphs. Um, and so what I'm showing here is for a specific state, um, in this case, quote unquote, medium density, but with a high density gradient. So there's a region around the cell that has very little, very low density. Um, what we see is that sort of the most, um, the highest preference actions are either to do nothing in blue or to migrate sort of perpendicular to that gradient uh, in yellow. When we add a drug, and I'm not gonna talk about the specifics of the drug, but when we add a drug, um, the cells strongly prefer to do nothing. And using IRL, we can quantify the degree of pre preference. This is very much a preliminary result. Um, it was a major challenge to sort of just get the data sets to work together. So um, we're still working on this. Uh, but key outcomes for this are, we have a novel framework for interpreting this dynamic data. Um, people don't really know what to do with it. It's really hard to work with. Um, and hopefully we'll have some physically meaningful understandings of cell preferences and goals that we can target. Um, I wanna acknowledge, uh, as I said, the Linderman, Luker, and Banovich labs have been great. We also, uh, through this, have been collaborating with Krishna Garakapati and Xuan Huan um, in the mechanical engineering department. And the funding from Midas has been instrumental in securing more funding from the Keck Foundation, which we were pretty excited about. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you so much. It's been great to hear from everybody. Hello, can you, oh. <coughs> can you, oh, yes. It's kind of weird to not speak with the mask on. Uh, it's, it's the exact opposite of what I was complaining about in my class earlier this semester. Okay, so hello and welcome everyone. I'm uh, Rahul Adhania, assistant professor at uh, Michigan Public Health. And, uh, bef oh, sorry. Yeah, and before I begin, uh, thank you to my collaborators, Anne Fernandez, Paramveer, who just spoke a bit ago, um, Karandeep Singh, and our rock star RA, uh, Alistair Holm. So um, in recent years, and more so in the last couple of years, there has been this uh, pronounced and legitimate focus on uh, issues around algorithmic bias and uh, the implications to perpetuate inequities in uh, inference that you would draw from those algorithms. Um, and that applies to an array of uh, disciplines from uh, criminal justice to policing to education to healthcare. And uh, as uh, Paramveer had alluded to in his talk earlier, one of the contributors to this uh, sort of uh, 
inequitable modeling, so to say, right, is uh, this, this, this upper, uh, setup where the data sets that you have often do not capture adequately the populations that you would want to make inference upon. And uh, especially, uh, so that, and you, when you draw the, the statistical inference from these uh, data sets, for underrepresented minorities, let's say, uh, which by design or default are underrepresented in the data, right? And you want to make inference for them based on your statistical models, then at best, your models have limited utility. Or at worst, especially for sensitive domains, it could have adverse consequences. And uh, talking about sensitive domains, you have this sphere of opioid misuse or overuse, right? And it continues to be a big uh, US public health problem. And uh, along with that is also deeply stigmatized behavior, so a double whammy of sorts. So essentially the costs of uh, any quote unquote inequitable modeling is all the more so in this particular setup. So uh, there are three uh, recently published work, one by our uh, members of our group, Karandeep Singh and Anne Fernandez, on uh, predicting what's called persistent opioid overuse, or use, which essentially is a measure of uh, chronic or continuous opioid use post the surgery. Um, and these three studies did uh, sort of, you know, look at slightly different populations uh, with different sorts of modeling assumptions and modeling frameworks and relatively different, uh, slightly different outcome measures as well. But the sort of crux of all these three studies was it was, there was no structured approach towards uh, uh, exploring the costs for subgroups, and subgroups essentially race ethnic subgroups within the data. And as we know, opioid use or most public health crises do have significant heterogeneities in how they affect race ethnic subgroups. So that's something that's like a, a thing that's worth exploring, and that motivated us to our research questions, which was number one, to examine the costs of these inequities, and what happens when the model doesn't do an appropriate job at capturing the, uh, sort of predicting the outcome for your subgroups of interest. And uh, also explore hypotheses and potential reasons for why those uh, sort of inequities are there in the first place. And once we do that, the next aim is to sort of go into understanding how we can adapt, uh, adopt transfer learning approaches or covariate shift approaches to make these models more robust to data set, data set and distributional shifts. Um, so, the, up, the first step to examine the inequities approach, what we did was essentially uh, evaluate uh, for all these three models, the performance of our uh, models amongst the various race ethnic subgroups as the data allowed us to. And we used data from the Michigan Genomics cohort, which was around 24,000 patients, and with a super large set of covariates. And uh, one advantage of that was it allowed us to sort of also, uh, given, as I mentioned, that these three studies and models were using different covariate sets. Some were using mainly EHR data, some were using mainly claims data. So the advantage of this Michigan Genomics cohort let us, helped us to sort of exploit the, that huge dimensional space to answer these questions. And uh, we sort of used model fit measures like C statistic or AUC measures, right, to compare the performance across these uh, subgroups of interest. Um, and these are the, some preliminary findings that we have, right? So we uh, essentially did these subgroup analyses for these models, and uh, we compared uh, the overall performance, the, the performance on the whole, whole, whole population, that is the test set, compared to uh, non-Hispanic non whites and to the black uh, sort of population in our data. We could not uh, do the analysis for other subgroups like Asians or Hispanic populations because we didn't really have enough of them in the data to begin with. Again, sort of just perpetuates what I began as my motivation with. Um, what was really interesting to us, which sort of, you know, uh, was, was anticlimactic to what we were expecting was the model really performed well for the black uh, folks in the data. And despite that the model, the data set, and I haven't gone into details about the data descriptions because of time constraints, was overwhelm overwhelmingly non-Hispanic whites. So the model was doing really, really well on black uh, people. So that sort of turned the script upside down, so to say, right? Um, but so in, in, a, in, a, in a preliminary view, you might think that, hey, the model is doing really well for black people, so it's, it's a win, right? Is it a win though? Are we sure if it's a win though? Or what specific characteristics or reasons make the model so good for, let's say, black people in the data? So we did some basic uh, exploratory, and one of the hypotheses that we sort of came up with was uh, uh, that the black patients in our data have more variance or variation or heterogeneities in the distributions of their covariates compared to the others, uh, other, other populations, thereby lending their covariates a higher predictive power 
in discriminating between the ones and the zeros, so to say. And we did find some evidence of that. So uh, what we did was we essentially looked at uh, some of the variables which uh, in our all the three models were found to have the most predictive power. And we did see that there's a much higher variation for our black population on those variables compared to our non-black population in the data. Um, and yeah, so this was essentially, you know, neighborhood and census track level information compared to, again, males versus uh, uh, in the black population versus non-black. And the story sort of remains consistent almost through all the, all the variables that we had, right? There was way more heterogeneity in what, in what sorts of black patients were showing up to the, do to the, to the Michigan medicine setup compared to non-Hispanic whites that we had. So uh, that sort of makes us think about further going down that line to sort of figure out if we adopt approaches like matching our uh, non-Hispanic white, so our black patients with non-black patients to understand what's accounting for these uh, discrepancies in uh, or awesome performances for just blacks alone, or is this the matter of the covariates that we have for the blacks, black population? And we're also adding new data from the MGI cohort, which gives us enough power to do the same analyses for our other subgroups, for Hispanic populations and for Asians, to see whether these uh, findings really hold for them as well. Um, and moving on, uh, as I alluded to initially, right, that is a high AUC or a high predictive uh, power for uh, the black population necessarily a good thing. So what are the implications of these uh, high, predictive, uh, hi high prediction performance for the black population further down the line? So we're going to use decision curves to sort of understand what are the, what are sort of the, the, the implications for those populations for this, for these one or zero as an opioid or a non-opioid uh, using patient. And uh, the, th the next part of the aim, which we haven't gone into yet, would be once we do that, we'll uh, sort of adapt these approaches, these covariate shift approaches, to make these models more sort of uh, equitable, so to say, for our subgroups in the data. Thank you. All right, hi everybody. My name is Lucy Spiker, and I am representing my faculty team listed up here on our development of a continuous fetal monitoring system. So in 2015, there were 2.6 million stillbirths globally, and of the marker, the global markers of fetal and maternal health, the stillbirth rate has been the slowest to decline over the past two decades. In the United States, um, the stillbirth rate also varies by race. So compared to non-Hispanic white women, the stillbirth rate is 10% higher for Hispanic women, 30% higher for um, American Indian or Alaskan Native women, and more than double for non-Hispanic black women. So providing access to convenient and affordable maternal and fetal care is crucial. Currently, there are three tests that happen in the clinical space, being kick counting, the non-stress test, and the biophysical profile. And they increase in accuracy as we go. So kick counting is easy for mothers and can be completed at home. The non-stress test uses non-invasive measures of fetal heart rate to kind of uh, understand fetal well-being. And the biophysical profile is the most comprehensive test, which uses five different markers um, of fetal well-being. However, um, although kick counting is easy, mothers only perceive about less than half of the fetal movement that actually happens. And although the non-stress test um, is non-invasive, it still has high false positive rates that range over 50%. And the biophysical profile, although our most comprehensive test, it's invasive, it's often misused, meaning that the results that come from the test um, aren't comprehensive of fetal well-being in general. And it's only reliable for five to seven days. So often mothers come in for twice weekly twice weekly testing. So this kind of uh, is an emerging field as scientists are um, starting to use wearable sensors to kind of understand fetal movement data sets and fetal well-being in general. So we're kind of using these four most relevant studies to, to demonstrate the gap that relies um, in literature. So the first study um, was completed with a stationary subject with one accelerometer and it um, kind of resulted in moderate accuracy. Then when we introduce maternal movement in the second study, um, we get a really low accuracy due to these noisy data artifacts. The third, third study is a bit more relevant. Um, although the mother is stationary and they're still only using one sensor type, they introduced ultrasound as a ground truth validation set of data, which ended in a highly accurate method. And the fourth study, which is the most relevant to our proposed approach, um, uses multiple sensor types, including acoustic sensors and accelerometers, 
um, and also use this as ultrasound validation, but they only achieved a moderate accuracy. So there lies a gap in what we're able to achieve in getting these really accurate and continuous fetal movement data sets, which is where our approach comes in. So we plan to use a wearable system um, of multimodal sensors to use for moms while they're at home completing their daily activities and getting these highly accurate results. So for our approach, we're gonna use a two different types of sensors, including inertial measurement units and a strain gauge, and then validate our data, our data using this ultrasound ground truth. So there will be two segments to the study, a stationary part and then a part where the mother is gonna be moving and doing um, daily activity, um, activities of daily living, which are going to include kind of um, sitting up from a chair, drinking water, talking, those kind of things that a mom would typically do at home. So in the meantime, uh, <laughs> meant to say, so we are working on IR IRB approval for human subject testing as pregnant mothers are a very vulnerable population. Um, it's been really difficult to kind of achieve that. So we're waiting on approval actually this week. And once we gain approval, we're looking to recruit about 20 subjects for our pilot test. In the meantime, we've collected this simulated data set. Um, so these two different sets of data are um, plotted on the same axes. The acceleration and angular velocity data come from the inertial measurement units, and the strain comes from voltage from our strain gauge. On the left, we have a simulated fetal kick, and on the right, we have a maternal cough. So it's easy to imagine that the fetal movement can kind of get lost in the maternal movement that happens, even in a movement as small as a cough. But a fetal movement isn't always going to happen while the mother is moving, so that's kind of our argument for why we need these continuous data sets that are really long in time. Typically in the clinic, they're only tested for about 30 minutes, but we hope to kind of gain a much longer data set so we can see this movement over time while the mom's completing her daily activities. So this is kind of where our novel machine learning algorithm comes into play. So we use the time series data from the um, inertial measurement units, from the strain gauge, and then we'll go through some pre-processing techniques, including denoising, data cropping, determination of window sizes. And then we'll take that process data as our input to our deep learning model. We're currently investigating recurrent and convolutional neural network architectures. And then we plan to kind of validate our performance based on cross-validation, accuracy, and AUC um, performance factors. So what we expect to learn from this deep learning model um, is relationships between different data types, be that fetal movement or maternal movement. And then we hope to kind of optimize our model and use some reinforcement learning strategies to kind of learn which sensors to gain data from when to gain data from those sensors to get a better understanding of when fetal movement is actually happening. So we wanted to thank Madas for the funding and thank, thank you to all of you for listening and coming out today. So uh, I'm the final one to give the talk, and uh, just want to say that it's impressive to see so many diverse projects. Uh, it literally blew my mind, and I think, uh, in, you know, that I sort of position my talk as just one of the many possible examples how Midas could be supporting impressive research. So, um, so this project is falling onto the under the umbrella of uh, the goal of harnessing real-world, high-dimensional dynamic data for individualized health. So the key word is individualized health. And uh, in the sp spirit of um, having some in-person engagement, I was making some slides about myself and also my group. So um, I joined Michigan in 2016, and my interest, and my group's interest, hopefully, is to design, apply some methods that inform decisions, uh, health decisions made by individuals, or people would call precision health, uh, by the sort of the names. And, uh, we use a lot of different techniques, uh, such as latent variable models, causal inference methods, um, and especially computational tools that can scale to large data. And we have, in our group, we have lots of different collaborations in terms of uh, disease etiology studies, predictions, diagnosis, and health policy evaluation. And uh, this is my group, and uh, we established this little virtual group uh, since 2020. It's a small group, but we hope to do something interesting. And uh, returning to the data science part, or the science part, what is our goal? I think I want to share a vision that uh, we truly hope that we want to be living in a society where we are served by learning, org learning health organizations in which uh, people continuously improve healthcare by learning from the past 
clinical research and practice. And these are basically made available by many different data sources. And as you have seen, for example, in the previous talk, we have these uh, very uh, high frequency measurements of these biosignals. But there are other data too, uh, especially those captured via encounters with um, uh, in medical, uh, how to say, in providers, you have these uh, measurements, you have diagnoses, you have uh, prescriptions and other expenditure data. And uh, they often can be found in what we call EHR, electronic health records, or claims data if, you, if you're uh, in the plan of Blue Shield, Blue Shield Blue Cross, you know, you probably, your data probably is in the data set I'm analyzing. Of course, I don't know who you are. Um, anyway, I think there is uh, kind of uh, also an ongoing, well, ongoing example where uh, you want to sort of use these information that has been collected to understand what are the profiles of individuals who tends to be high risk group and you want to do something about it. and also for a patient who is, imagine a doctor, for a patient who is sitting across the table and this patient want to know what is going to happen to me, you want to be providing a prediction of the health trajectory in the future. Uh, so for this project, uh, we were, of course, uh, taking the data science approach. So I am trained as a statistician, or you know, some people like to call that machine learning. I'm fine with that. Uh, you know, uh, the goal is uh, trying to do some scientifically structured latent variable model, and uh, we will be using data coming from claims database. So there, there were three aims broadly, and uh, we are about to finish aim one. Uh, so AIM-1 is trying to characterize dynamic clinical progression of patients and determine the key predictors of clinical progression using longitudinal diagnosis codes. You will hear more about this. And in the second AIM, essentially, we are trying to use the fact that uh, uh, when you have diagnosis codes recorded, these codes are usually from very kind of unspecific to specific. For example, if I go to a doctor, uh, uh, say I have a neck pain, and that is a code. And doctor asked me, hey, why, why do you have neck pain? It's because I have left pain because of something happening to my left shoulder. Okay, tell me more. Because I was playing basketball yesterday and uh, they gave me another code. Say, neck pain because of left shoulder because of sports events. So these codes are increasingly more specific. And uh, the aim too is basically how to analyze these data that have taxonomic nature. Aim three is trying to implement these software so people can use them. So this is a team of, uh, I would say, currently five people. And the majority of this work is done by my wonderful PhD student, uh, Min Bing Lee. Uh, uh, and uh, we have another student, Abby, on the team, joining with uh, M1, M2 in terms of software. And uh, we have a collaborator from uh, School of Medicine and also Andrew Ryan from uh, School of Public Health. Uh, so in this, the example we are giving here is uh, venous from uh, BTE for short. It's basically blood clot. And especially common uh, uh, in cancer patients. And essentially, imagine a situation that uh, you have blood clots in the leg, and it can break loose and travel to lung or heart, and it can be fatal. So what people are doing is trying to make sure that they, once they diagnose, they want to give them um, blood thinners. So these blood clots get uh, dissolved. And physicians, or the clinician in this team is interested in individuals' health trajectory and how these trajectories can be explained by uh, factors that are at baseline, say at the time of diagnosis, like cancer types, gender, age, other things, and also information that's happening over time. Uh, what is the data source? So we were using, we are using Optum Insight Medical Claims data. So as I said, uh, this is the product of United Healthcare, and uh, it contains more than 70 million rows. Uh, we were only using 15,000 patients, primarily because this is a subset of patients who have cancer and who have blood clots. Um, and it's ranging in these uh, two time points, January 1st to September 30, 2015, because after this, people, the system changed to ICD-10 from ICD-9, so that represents some data processing challenges. And we were, in this particular project, we are focusing on using information of diagnosis codes. And here are some examples of the codes. And in this plot, I'm showing you an example. So this is for one patient. And you don't need to look at every uh, word on the right, but I'm just going to explain this. On the x-axis, these are the time. On the y-axis, these are the codes that has ever appeared in this patient's record. And one dot, you should read this uh, vertically. 
So one dot represents that condition appeared in that person at this, on this day. And on this day, not every condition appeared. So I was only illustrating the conditions that has appeared. And if you look from left to right, you can see that uh, certain codes uh, appeared repeatedly, certain codes newly appeared. And in the red boxes, these represent episodes. I will not go into how we define them, but essentially you do have multiple encounters or you do have multiple issues um, it, that you may want to visit, visit hospital. So we will be looking at uh, this data this way. So for each, within each red box, we're just, to, we're just going to aggregate these codes together and uh, we're going to treat them as documents. So uh, basically we are going to formulate the model that can model these high dimensional codes over time. Uh, so what is the approach we're going to do it? Apologies for the uh, title that's been hidden. Anybody know this? Uh, Plato's cave, yeah? So the idea is that if you look at uh, the shadows, these are the measurements we have. And actually, we are the observers who have forever chained to the wall. And uh, the lights are, the, the fire is, the, is at the back of the wall and uh, projecting the objects we hope to infer. So this is my kind of a view of how latent variables can be useful. We are always going to observe these shadows and try to observe what is going on uh, in reality. So in this case, we are going to do the similar uh, thing here. So we're thinking that, hey, over time, a, per a person may have multiple biological aberrations with varying degrees of importance. So uh, maybe the problem-related digestive issues are going to, going to be decreasing, the problem with the kidney is going to be decreasing, and maybe the problem with the lung is going to be re remaining relatively the, s the same, a similar level of importance. So in this spirit, we're going to, and this is not the patient, that clearly you can see we can place different uh, kind of uh, probabilities upon each of the possible latent biological aberrations at each time to explain what are the codes we observed. So our goal is trying to model these trajectories of how these uh, bars are going to evolve over time. And uh, b by building a model from these uh, proportions or these topics to these codes, we can generate, a, uh, generate data that can be used for prediction. So I'm not going through these. Uh, these are basically some kind of uh, scholarly activity that we always want to show in terms of uh, relevant literature. Essentially, it's going to be built upon topic models, but not mo many models have been built for cluster documents. In our case, uh, episodes of codes that coming f came from the same person. Uh, we never uh, we never seen uh, this kind of model being applied to structured claims data. So. I think there is both a methodological interest and also a question of how this kind of model can be extended and model used in uh, health uh, claims data context. So this is a graphical model uh, which for which I'm not going to explain in detail. And if you're interested in DAG, probably learn from some awesome professors in Midas and, or in uh, other schools, you probably know this kind of representation. But the idea is that by having this kind of representation, we have a model, we have a way to do the inference. So uh, in this, and I'm just going to show you some data analysis results. Uh, in this case, we're going to be illustrating using, say, about 2,500 patients, and each patient has at least three episodes of, well, this is documents, but in our real data application, we want them to have at least three episodes. And uh, we were looking at uh, 439 unique codes. We were fitting a model using 10 topics, so there could be at most 10 biological aberrations. You probably will be asking me, hey, how could, be, how could there be 10? How do you know it's not 11 or 9? Well, that's a good question. I mean, we're going to uh, do some more work in terms of modeling this K here. And we have covariates like uh, time since baseline and baseline age, Carlson com comorbidity score. If you have ever read anything about COVID papers, I think this score kind of appeared a lot, indicating a, how generally healthy this person is. And also, we were trying to use random effects models to model the correlation among the codes generated by the same person. And these are the results. So essentially, uh, what you see here are 10 topics. Apologies for the order here, but uh, clearly it's because of this uh, one 10, starting with one here. So across these 10 topics, uh, we are showing you the most important uh, codes. Um, and uh, I'm not going to dive into detail, but these topics are of diverse interpretations, and we have colored them by different systems. Some are related to uh, uh, mental uh, disorders, some are related to nerve si nervous systems, some are related to circulatory systems, so on and so forth. And we're also able to you know, look into the details of these uh, uh, 
the chance of a code happening given the biological aberration, and we can interpret these uh, topics as something that's related to respiratory issues, uh, brain-related issues, digestive issues. And also we can do the in individual specific trajectory predictions for three patients. So we can characterize, hey, you know, you're going to be, for, say for patient two, you're going to be okay regarding the second uh, biological aberration, you know, you're going to be fine, uh, but you should be careful about the, you know, the red one, uh, respiratory related issues, because we predict that you will have a higher chance of uh, seeing that kind of problem, because we predict you, you have a lot of codes related to re respiratory system that's going to be appearing uh, in your records. Um, so yeah, I think this kind of plot is going to show uh, individual how they, their health is going to progress. And we're also able to estimate individual uh, covariance effect. Uh, I will not dive into this, but the idea is that uh, we found some quite uh, uh, consistent findings with uh, what the clinicians told us. For example, if you have brain cancer, then you tend to have a lot of topics related to brain, related uh, aberrations. So what are the next steps uh, uh, from, I'm a junior faculty and it submits a paper, so we're going to consider a methodological paper, and I think I have been, we have been doing that for a long time. And uh, uh, we will also implement the software and uh, hopefully to make this more broadly available. And because this model is based on topic model, so we will be casting it in terms of topic modeling. So hopefully many other people will pick it up. And we'll be moving on to the second aim and we will hope to uh, use these results to prepare for a methodological grant application. And the clinicians uh, in the team will help us with the uh, scientific significance. And I think there are questions about, you know, uh, how these tools can be relevant in clinical context. I believe this is not a unique question for our projects, but rather you spend like two, year, two, two years of one year of your life developing this tool. I think it's a legitimate ask, you know, uh, who would care or why bother, right? You want to ask who would be interested in using them. And of course, uh, the more you know about your data, the more you hate about your data, the more you hate your data. It's because you realize that there are limitations for any particular data sources. That's why people do data integration. I see many people here doing. And I think the question that I'm still in, we're still exploring is what are the ex limitations and are some limitations fixable? And I think those represent uh, the next steps in terms of uh, our research. Thanks everybody. Um, I want to thank you all for the wonderful work that uh, you've all been doing and that you've shared with us today. This has just been fantastic. I want to uh, emphasize that uh, at Midas, we're not a uh, funding agency. Our goal is to help and support data science and AI-related work uh, all across the university in whatever ways we can. Um, and so the pods grant is a small seed grant as an investment in you and in the work that you do and we would like to help in any way that we can so as as we, we'd like to see you succeed and and uh, be able to claim that people who got pods grants went on and did great things and and if there are ways that we could help you please do reach out and we'll do what we can um, and uh, Thank you for coming. Uh, there are still sandwiches left. Take one home. Uh, hang out and chat and make some more connections. <laughs> <laughs>